Welcome to another edition of Journey of Hope. Stories of people who share their journey, their journey through life, their journey encountering different road obstacles along the way. Our special guest today is Bill Vansell. Bill is an author, graphic designer, a cancer survivor, and a liver transplant recipient. Bill's been on our program before. He shared his journey of first coming to Loma Linda. And Bill, it's so good to have you here. As you know, we've got people from around the world that are watching. And we got a group of people are watching now that probably didn't see the first interview we had a few years ago. So tell us a little bit about who you are, where you're from, and uh, how things were going. And then you found out you had cancer here. Well, I, I live in uh, Wisconsin. I'm in, I live in Madison. And um, in early uh, 2004, I found out that I had prostate cancer. And like uh, I'm sure you've heard this story over and over from so many men, I didn't want to do surgery. I did my research, uh, found out about proton uh, radiation treatment at Loma Linda, looked into it, called Loma Linda, sent some materials out here, came out for an interview, uh, and I knew that this is, uh, this is, the place this is to where come. I wanted to, to be for but my Bill, treatment. Just before we get into your even getting here and being diagnosed, tell us what kind of work, where have you been most of your life, and what have you been doing? Well, I was in um, the radio business for about 40 years. I started out as a as a disc jockey at uh, one dollar an hour on a little 100 watt AM radio station, and I advanced uh, to um, being the vice president and general manager and part owner of five radio stations in Madison. And um, so this is all in the Madison area. Well, I worked for a few years in the Quad Cities in uh, Davenport, Iowa, and then came to uh, uh, to Wisconsin in uh, around the end of 1969, and I was there. Until around 2001, I, uh, the radio business had gotten so uh, big and so uh, uh, corporate oriented and I just got kind of tired of all the board of directors meetings and the rat race and managing a big staff of 80 people and I decided to go off on my own and start my own business. I'd always um, really, uh, my calling I think was to be an artist and so I opened a graphic design firm and I still work as um, uh, designing websites and helping uh, uh, businesses with their marketing, designing logos and uh, doing that sort of thing. This is in Madison? Yes. Okay. So then a few years ago, and how many years ago are we talking about you were diagnosed with cancer? It was 2004. 2004. Right. Okay. So things are going along well, and mm -hmm. you, you get this word that you got cancer. Yep. What, what kind of an impact did that make? Well, um, I, I can't say that I was ever... Um, I didn't experience fear. The title of my book is Don't Fear the Big Dogs, and right. I've, I don't scare easily, and I knew that that prostate cancer uh, was something that could be treated. And even though mine was at a little bit more advanced stage than some of the guys, I knew it could be treated. So it wasn't really a, a really overwhelming thing to you? Not really. I just said, I got to get down to business here and do my homework, figure out um, uh, what to tell my urologist when I tell him I don't want to do surgery, which he's recommending. And uh, after I found Loma Linda, um, I, I was certain that was the treatment I wanted to do. And so I started. I came out here, I met with um, uh, Dr. Rossi and uh, Sharon Hoyle, and um, we, he started me on some, um, some uh, uh, medicine that I took for a month or so, and then I came back and started treatment. It was in May, I think. And um, while I was out here for the, the duration, my daughter, uh, Tori Lou, which is uh, short for uh, Victoria Louise, Tori Lou joined me for uh, a good share of the time I was here. She was 50 years younger than me at the time. She was 13, and, um, and I was 63. Now she's 19, and I'm 64. Okay. So. <laughs> That's good. That's quite good the way it yeah. works out. So she came out, and we spent uh, so much time together doing interesting things, being all of a sudden in a, in a, almost like in a foreign country because neither of us had spent a great deal of time here. Um, but we got to know and love the place, and she learned to surf, and we went to every skateboard park from Ukaipa to, to um, uh, Upland and, and, uh, and Palm Springs. And we, uh, we visited friends down in San Diego. All the while you were going yeah, oh, I'm, 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 Halfway through my treatment, 
I, we went up to, to uh, Lake Gregory and I went down a water slide. <laughs> Yeah. Actively involved. It's in the book. It's yeah. an example of unconditional love. And this book, Don't Fear the Big Dogs, really is the story of what? It's the story of um, a, a dad who is um, facing a, a problem and a daughter who is sharing uh, that journey with her dad. And they both get so caught up in the adventure of just doing what they're doing that the treatments almost became secondary. Our typical routine would be, I would get, I rented a place, um, I think it was the same place that Charles rented, one of your other guests recently. Um, we, um, we would, I would get up in the morning, go over, walk over, because it was close, do my treatment at about uh, 8.30 in the morning or so, and then uh, get done before 9 o'clock, come back, wake up Tori Lou and say, what are we going to do today? Oh, I want to go here or there. And so we'd, then we'd plan our day. And um, like I say, the treatments were just um, sort of uh, almost something we did, but it wasn't. It was <laughs> incidental to the to the adventure that we were enjoying. So I took pictures all along the way, uh, pictures of me uh, on my way out here, driving out from Wisconsin, and while I was here by myself at the beginning, and another series of pictures uh, while Tori Lou was here with me, and another whole series of pictures on the journey back home. And when I started looking at those, it, 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 and a friend of mine looked at them, and, and we, we both agreed, this is a book. This needs to be a book. So we made a book. I made a book and uh, told the story um, of the whole journey with Tori Lou, And that's really what it was about. But because I talked about proton treatment and about Loma Linda, to some extent throughout the sure. book, and explaining it in easy to understand terms, um, the book became somewhat important um, as a way to start getting the word out to a broader audience. I did um, Barnes and Noble book events in 25 different cities around the country, about 70 uh, radio and TV interviews, um, sharing the story about the story and the talking dogs. about Proton and about yeah. Loma, and and it it captured the interest of some of the media because. Well, they hadn't heard of Proton in many places around the country. So it became a vehicle to communicate yeah. the story then. And uh, Bob Marchini's great book, uh, um, you, uh, you Can Beat Prostate Cancer and You Don't Need Surgery to Do It, hadn't come out yet. In fact, I was urging Bobby, get done with his book. We need your book. It's going to be, uh, you know, um, far more inclusive as far as information than what mine is. And so he came out with it, and, and, and he sort of overshadowed me on the charts all of a sudden. You know, his, his book's selling like crazy. But I, when I'd come back for the support group meetings to talk about the book and everything, I would, I'd often say, you know, if you, if you can only afford one book, buy Bob's. Uh, but if you can buy two, then, uh, you know, buy one of Bob's and one of mine. If you can afford three, buy Bob's and buy two of mine. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so anyway, it's the story of your experience. Now tell us a little bit why you were out here. I mean, you're going around with Tori Lou, and this is the story. Uh, you were being treated for your cancer. Right. And then you finish up your treatments and you go back uh, home and you've written on another, you've written another book. Well, I've, I wrote a children's book. It's mostly photos and a story that kind of wraps around it. And, um, and, and I'm working on another book, which um, will, it's, it's going to talk about my liver transplant experience, but it's, it's not quite the same. Yeah. You, a, when you come to Loma Linda, it's an, a whole experience, and it's more than just the medical treatment. There's a, you, uh, I, I've said this and it sounds corny, but you know, I, I left my liver in Wisconsin, but a part of my heart will always be here in Loma Linda. And so I love coming back, and um, yet I've never been invited to join the Brotherhood of the Scalpel. Uh, the Brotherhood of the Balloon is a special organization, and, the, and Loma Linda is a very special place. And a lot of the things that I learned about confidence in the people that are giving you the treatment and the faith that they are going to perform effectively and knowing that you have chosen the right place to be for that treatment and the right type of treatment. Once you do that, then you can maintain this don't fear the big dogs attitude, a positive attitude that will get you through anything. And I found it got me through the liver transplant because I reflected on my experience at Loma Linda endlessly. And 
thank thank you so much, Lynn, because with your support, uh, uh, Lynn called me uh, so many times while I was in the hospital, and we prayed together over the phone, and I thank you for well, that. Well, yeah, for our listening audience, things are going well. You get your prostate cancer taken care of. It's almost like a bump in the road now. <laughs> and then a few years later, uh, you begin having a few little problems, and uh, apparently you were notified that, you know, your liver wasn't doing too well. But actually, when you went into the hospital, what did you go in the hospital for? Well, I, <laughs> I went into the hospital for uh, hernia surgery. And I thought, well, this would be a piece of cake. I'll go in. I'll have the surgery, I'll be home in a week, maybe less. And, and when are we talking about? We're talking about... This was end of uh, last year. I went into the hospital on December 29th. December of... 29th. Oh, uh, December 29th of right. 2009. Nine. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You go in for hernia repair. Right. And, we, and they started noticing that my liver uh, tests were kind of off where they should be. So we had to kind of wait until they felt there was a safe window of opportunity to go in and do this surgery without messing up the liver. Well, it turns out the window of opportunity was there, but it still messed up the liver. And so I, I'm a, I don't even know about the hernia surgery. I think I had it. But they, they, as soon as I woke up from that, they said, well, you know, you're going to have to stay in the hospital a while because your liver is really you know, doing some weird things. And I started to get real puffed up and, and turn yellow. And they said, you, you know, one of the, the doctor came in. He said, you don't have any choice. Your liver's in failure. He said, you have to have a new liver. That's your only, only way. And uh, so, so, so apparently you're on a list. Then they yep. place you on a list. And be, there's a thing called a MELD score. It's a, a model end-term liver disease score, uh, similar to the PSA score you have when you're checking out whether you uh, have prostate cancer or not. But it measures the the um, degree of liver disease that you have or liver failure, or whatever. And um, the, the computers will recognize this up until about 40. Anything above a 15 would suggest you need to start thinking about a liver transplant. Well, mine was 40-something off the chart. It was off the chart. Off the chart completely. So I went right to the top of the list, the waiting list, and they got a liver. They put it in me, and... Um, That's doc- not a simple surgery either. Well, no, not at all. It was The first one was about uh, 13 hours, I think. So you had so, a 13-hour operation. Yeah, and then the, the surgeon uh, looked at this liver that was in me and said, you know, checked how it was performing. He said, this isn't going to work. You know, this is not a good liver. Bill needs a better liver than this. You mean after it's already in? It was in. And, and they began watching the and diagnosing and functioning, and but not functioning well enough to keep me alive for a great length of time. Fortunately, it kept me alive for about five or six days until um, they found a second liver and did a second surgery and put another liver in Now, me. I don't think you remember too I don't much. Remember, no. I mean, and I was on the phone constantly <laughs> trying to find out when I, people praying. And when I came out of the anesthesia after several days, I started hearing these rumors that I'd had two surgeries, and I thought I was, like, dreaming. I had dreams all through the surgery time, and I thought I was still dreaming. And I'd ask some of the people that walked by and say, Now, um, did I have the surgery yet? Yeah. Okay, second question. Is this real or am I still dreaming? And they'd say, no, it's real. I said, okay, and I didn't believe them. So finally, when the surgeon, uh, main surgeon came in himself and said, wow, you're doing okay, and you had two, two surgeries. I said, really? Okay, I believe it now. And, uh, and then the, the recovery period was, was quite lengthy. I, I was in the hospital a total of three and a half months. So you went in for a simple little hernia repair right. <laughs> and came out of the hospital three and a half months later. And I know you were hovering, Bill, between yeah. life and death day by day. In fact, you know, they weren't sure when the first that you're, you know, you're, you had the first surgery and then that liver went into failure and they were looking for another one and immediately put you right to the top of the list again. Yep. And then they performed <clears throat> that surgery. And I know for for so many weeks that was back and forth and I remember the first time I talked to you that you were able to really talk and communicate and it was so great to hear your voice. Well, so you're in the hospital for three and a half months, so what's happening to you emotionally when you're really beginning to realize what's going on? What's happening? I mean, where, 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 what are you thinking about all this? Well, I think um, when, you, uh, when you have prostate cancer or any kind of cancer and you get cured, 
you feel like uh, you have a whole new, new life, a, new lease, a new lease on life, and a new attitude toward life, and a, a new dedication to uh, celebrating every single day and making the most of each day. And when I had the liver transplant, um, and transplants, transplants, and was finally able to go home. Um, I started to realize how lucky I was and how fortunate I was and uh, how very grateful I was for the fine uh, medical professionals that, uh, that performed this uh, medical miracle, so to speak, and, and all the people like yourself, friends from all over the country that, yeah. that sent emails and, and, and made phone calls and sent cards. And, um, and it was, I think it was that support from uh, friends and, and, and people that all of a sudden you realize, man, I heard from people I hadn't heard from for a long time. And people came up to see me that I hadn't been seen for a long time. And later I kind of figured out maybe they didn't think, maybe they thought they wouldn't ever see me again, so they had to come up and see me. But I didn't think of that at the time. Sure. I thought, this is so great to have Everybody's all these people showing, out. showing how much they care. Yeah. And it really helps, but the, keeping that uh, attitude and maintaining the attitude uh, that I expressed in my book, Don't Fear the Big Dogs, uh, really is what helped me make it through. Well, what kind of physical changes went through? If you're in the hospital for three and a half months and you're bedridden most of the time. Yeah, I was flat on my back for almost two months. I had, I had feeding tube down me for two months. Um, I lost about 70, 75 pounds. Um, I've gained back uh, enough of that now. But it, it took a long time to get, I had to learn to walk all over again. So, I mean, you're bedridden and totally incapacitated. Oh, yeah. So when you had you, to learn to walk all over again. Well, try to imagine you lay in a bed. And Not only, using muscles. The only time you get up is with four people on a sliding board sliding you off and helping you into a wheelchair so you can go get an x-ray and you come back and you go back into your bed. And eventually you start learning to take little steps with a walker. And when you, when you get that physical therapist on your arm and he's helping you down or he or she is helping you down the hallway of the, of the hospital and you take nine steps and they go, yeah. Celebrating nine steps. Yeah, <laughs> and make a big deal out of that, and it was. And just the, the idea of getting up and be, I, I actually, I had doubts about whether I was ever ever going to be a walk normally again and have the strength back, and you have to learn to get your balance back and everything. It's a long road back to, to, to recovery from that. So when you got out of the hospital, I mean, what... What was a part of your recovery? And you're still recovering. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? yeah. Really? Still uh, growing. I mean, it takes a long time to recover. That's right. And, like and um, I, um, I've been doing uh, exercise in um, the University of Wisconsin Sports Fitness Center. It has a beautiful, big, heated pool. They keep it at 94 degrees, and it's great. And I go in there um, five or six days a week and do at least an hour or more. Now, how long of, have you been doing this? I've been doing this for the last six weeks or so. Okay. And that has helped. I, uh, there was some thought that I, because I had become diabetic from the medications and so on, um, there was some thought that I might remain diabetic forever. I came off insulin about three weeks ago. So, I mean, I'm were you diabetic, diabetic when you went in the hospital? No. So I became diabetic. You became in there. diabetic as a result and of being I, in the hospital and going through all right. of this. This uh, and I came home surgeries. doing insulin three times a day and checking my blood sugar three four times a day. That we tapered that Are off. Were you taking shots or shot every day? I give myself the shot twice a day actually, okay. and uh, we got to a point where the the uh, blood sugar levels started to look pretty good. And and I suggested I said why don't we just try a week without any insulin see what happens. I said okay, try it. Don't fall down. And um, at the end of the week, the blood sugar t things were still normal. And uh, they right. checked my vitals and my, uh, did my, my um, labs and said, stop taking insulin. So you don't have to check your, you your blood sugar. You got yourself off of insulin. Yeah, I turned in my, my official diabetic card and done with that. And uh, we've reduced some of the anti-rejection drugs now, too. And uh, my blood pressure was off for a while, but we're getting that back. So were normal. you on blood pressure medicine? 
Uh, still am a little bit, okay. but um, but it's not like it was. No, it's come back down to it's it's normal now. And, and what it, are you attributing that to? The exercise in the, the, in the swimming pool. And what are you doing? I mean, you're going down to the pool, and are you just well, kind of splashing in, your hands, or what are you doing? Well, I splash my hands a little bit, but <laughs> the um, uh, in the in the they have a, a lap pool, okay, and we do complete laps. But I, it's too cold for me. <laughs> <laughs> I like the warm pool. So what I do is is um, my favorite exercise, they get show you all different exercises. You lift your leg up and put it back down and do this and that. All part of the therapy. Yeah, uh, but what I've started doing is I need to build up strength in my abs and in my core. So I've been doing um, kind of dog paddling under just my head out of the water and dog paddling, kind of do, doing pretend cross-country skiing, keeping really? myself up off the bottom of the pool. So you are getting yourself up? And oh, off. yeah. Okay. And by just moving my legs and arms like that, I can keep myself up off the bottom for about 20 minutes at a time. Well, that's a great exercise. And uh, it really is. It's tremendous exercise, not only uh, for the muscles, but everything else. Well, cardio and everything, yeah. yeah. So, so that, that's been a, a great uh, help. Are you walking? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, just little short distances. Oh, I can I can walk. Uh, I could take uh, take my dog to the to the dog park and walk a mile or so with him, and I can handle that. Um, uh, one time I didn't walk. The other night when we had our advisory council meetings and we had dinner afterwards, and I was staying at the hotel right across the street. I'll tell this story on Bob Marquini. I know you're going to be interviewing him on your show real soon. Um, <laughs> Uh, he thought that um, it, not a good idea for me to walk across six lanes of traffic from the ho from the restaurant to the hotel after dark. And I thought that was a good idea because at the end of the day, I get a little yeah. wobbly sometimes, you know. So I get in the car. He's going to give me a ride to my hotel across the street. <laughs> so we start to come out, and this woman pulls in and takes up half the lane. And he's, what are you doing? And he backs up, and, and all of a sudden, another guy thought, Hang on here. <laughs> You're going to protect me from walking across the street, and we're going to get in a crash. <laughs> but we made it. You made it okay. We made it safely across, and uh, I'm, I thank him for that ride. But we'll be laughing about that for a while. Well, what, what are you now? You've been through a tremendous amount. I mean, you had the prostate cancer, which now looks like it was just a little bump in the road. Things are going along well. Then you go through this thing that took several months. You're still in the recovery process. What are your plans? My plans are to uh, continue to uh, maintain uh, an exercise program, watch my diet, keep my weight so that I can, can uh, live as many years as possible. And uh, I'm, Are you having a hard time maintaining the weight? Um, not really. I, uh, what I've found uh, is if I weigh myself every single day at exactly the same time and under the same conditions, um, some people say you shouldn't weigh yourself every day, but I believe in that. I, I, in the morning, I'll get up, and, uh, and before I get dressed, I'll weigh myself at the same time every morning, and, um, and then I keep a chart. You I've are got charting a, it. I've got it on my computer, an Excel chart. Okay. And if I, I'm, I'm trying to stay at uh, 174. That seems like a nice number. Um, and after I stay there a while, I might lower that a little bit. But I've got the, the chart set up. So how so long have you been at this? The, oh, the, about... No, since I started the exercise, I yeah, think so like six weeks or well, so. Well, I've been we've been uh, logging my weight for a long time, and I was up like 182 or something. Got it back down, but now if I if I hit 175, the number turns to red. Oh, it does. <laughs> you got it fixed. And I've got it set up so my transplant coordinator at the hospital can go online and see my numbers, so I'm being held accountable by someone. And by checking it every day, if I go over it a little bit, because I went out to dinner the night before or ate a hot dog at the football game or something, I can back off and eat a little bit less that day or exercise a little bit more and just keep it under control, you know, not look away and let it get out of control. Well, if I was hearing you correctly, it sounds like your experience here at Loma Linda a few years earlier, the kind of experience you had here kind of helped you well, through yeah. the experience you had. You, you not only learn to have confidence in the form of treatment and confidence in the people delivering the treatment, but um, you also learn the discipline. You're getting up every day or uh, you're going in every day for uh, your, whether you live uh, uh, 30 miles away and you drive in or whether you live near the hospital and can walk every day. You're in that routine. You go in, you go through the routine, you, you get in the, the pod and you do the treatment. And then and so you learn the discipline of that. And, um, uh, and, and I think, you know, I've applied so many of those, those things that I've learned uh, when I was here at Loma Linda to my experience. And when I was in 
in the hospital, I talked about Loma Linda and about proton Did treatment you? a lot. And uh, some of the doctors and nurses had actually heard of proton treatment, which was good because uh, there's some places around the country that uh, it's not as well known as it is, you know, here so, in in town. Yeah. So um, it 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 hasn't uh, it, it it became a huge part of my life, enough to write a book about it and. It will always be a great part of my life. Now, this next book you're going to write, is it going to be on this experience of going through the, uh, the liver transplant? Yeah, I've already started working on it, but I, I don't want to just write it about liver transplant. Cause sure. That's kind of boring, actually. Um, I, I want to talk about the experience and the, the emotional part of it and the value of the positive attitude and, and the, the value of maintaining friendships and support and asking for the for the help and, and, and not even asking for it, but at least appreciating the support and the prayers when they're there and, um, and relating my experience in Loma Linda to what I went through in Wisconsin and with the transplant. Well, you know, we're coming down to the end and Bill, it sounds like one of the important things that you've learned for this whole thing is take responsibility for your own health. Absolutely. You know, and the exercise and the diet and, and uh, the support and the fellowship from friends and family and, and all the people that were, were praying for you. Again, uh, as, I, as I think of our listening audience, I, I want to thank you for joining us, Bill, and for sharing your experience. And I know that God's not through with you, that he's going <laughs> to use you and your, your witness for him is going to be profound wherever you go. And the books that you've written are, are making an impact. And again, for those that are looking on, you know, Bill is as a remarkable illustration of, you know, you go through one crisis and you think it's all over, but there's, there are other bumps along the way and sometimes there's, there's great things that come into our lives that can be, uh, you know, almost devastating. But the family and the support, and the, whether it's a church or a support group or family, it's a very important part. And for those of you that are looking on, I know just this week that some of you have had something happen to you and you kind of think, what in the world am I going to do? Where am I going to turn? What am I going to, uh, how am I going to get through this? Well, I want to assure you that, that God knows all about you. He knows exactly where you're at. He's got a plan for your life, and he'll guide and direct and lead you just like he did, Bill. Until next week, God bless you, each one.